Okay, let's get started. Hopefully you're here for this. There was another session scheduled in this room and they swapped us. Um, so that's why I've kind of left this up. Uh, if, if you're expecting a GPT session, sadly, this is not it. Uh, that would be in the auditorium. That's what I, yeah. <laughs> that's why I said that. Well, right, yeah. I don't know if there was a sign over there. I know there's a sign here. Okay, all right. That's why I said that. Yes, yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, if you have not gone to thank the sponsors, please do. I know this is a paid event, um, so you're obviously paying to be here, um, but we can't do a lot of the things we do and some of the fun stuff like last night without sponsors. So even if you're not interested in their product, service, whatever, um, I always like to stop by and at least say thank you, because uh, I would love to come back here, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that they're stepping up to help. This is me. I'm SQL at speed everywhere online. I wrote a couple books, um, one about Azure AI, so part of me would like to see that GPT session too, um, and one about cloud migration as well. I get to drive a that race car once in a great while. Um, so if you're not too interested in data, but you like car racing, I will happily talk your ear off about that. A little bit more about me. I've been doing this a while. Um, I, was, I was purely a DBA for a long time, then expanded out into BI. And then as I got into consulting, just kind of Azure data things, um, so every, every story that I'll tell in this is something that I saw, something that happened to me or happened to somebody that I know well enough that they shared it with me so I could tell you. Um, I do run a local user group at home, so uh, thank you for being here. If there's a local user group by you, if you Google or Bing uh, Azure Data Tech Groups, um, the Azure Data community is uh, Microsoft supported. They don't tell us what to do, but they do help us with websites and things like that. Um, definitely check to see if there's one close to you. Um, getting involved in these has, has been a massive help. It honestly changed my life. I wouldn't be standing here if I hadn't started to go to things like that and SQL Saturdays and all of that. If you're not sure where Lexington, Kentucky is, it's kind of roundabout there. I looked, I am 7,514 km from home. So kind of a long flight, but uh, all right. So let's get started. How many of us know this meme? Okay, so for those of you that don't, that's pretty much it, where the dog is surrounded by a, what seems to be a room, a house, on fire. The dog is enjoying his coffee and saying, this is fine. So when I came up with the idea for this talk, I knew this meme, and it had been a running joke on a team that I ran, where every time we had, let's say, a fairly unstable platform for a period of time. And every time one of our alerts would go off or a user would call and say, this is down or this is slow, somebody would post this. So when I came up with the thought for this talk, I was like, well, I want to go give proper credit to the artist because I know it's a meme, but it's a comic. So obviously somebody made it. So the artist is KC Green. The comic strip is called On Fire, obviously. What's interesting is when I looked that up, I had assumed it was just this. Well, there's actually eight frames. And uh, not, not to get too dark here, but as it goes, by the eighth frame, the dog melts. So <laughs> it ends a little darker than this seems, but I kind of like starting off that way because this session is not only about taking care of databases, servers, and all that, but ourselves too. So we don't want to be the dog that melts. And I'll wrap up with some things at the end that have kind of personally helped me, um, just in terms of being patient and and things like that. It's very easy for us to make, while there's an incident happening, make the wrong decision somewhere and make a minor incident worse. Um, so hopefully, some of the things I talk about in the last five minutes or so will kind of help you just settle down because uh, we don't want to end up like the dog does. All right, so what does fine mean? And I'm going to ask for a raise of hands because I've given this session virtually a few times, in person only once. So since I can see all your hands, I'm going to ask you to raise them. But you don't have to if you don't want to. So how many of you do anything to baseline your databases right now? A few hands. All right, cool. So 
is, uh, for those of you that raised your hands, is it data-driven? Are there metrics around it? Or is it like a health report that you're writing for a manager or an executive or something like that? Both? OK. I've seen both, and both are fine. Now, obviously, us being data people, I would prefer metrics. Like, if, if, if the database is not performing, I want to know what that means. Is it slow? Is it using a lot of CPU? Is it using a lot of memory? Is it running OK right now, but about to be slow? But gut feel is OK, too. Um, as a consultant, this is hard, because you go in and out of a lot of environments, and you don't always spend a ton of time with one. But if you do, that gut feel can matter, too, because sometimes your metrics are saying, hey, everything's running great. But you know you're, you know, well, when I sign into this server that's connected to this database, I know the metrics say it's OK, but I also know what it, how fast it should go. And it feels like it's slow. It feels like something's off. That's OK. It, that's hard to convey to a manager or something like that. But if your kind of spidey sense is, well, this is not how it usually is, then you want those, you want those kind of metrics to be able to fall back on to kind of supplement what that gut feel means. Um, so for those of you that don't, is it, and I've been in this spot, is it because you just, you don't have a tool to do it? Your boss has said, well, keep this stuff running, but we don't have a budget for a monitoring tool or anything like that? Maybe, okay. Um, so what I'm gonna walk you through here is, we're gonna talk about some tools. We're also gonna talk about some things to do if you don't have tools. Um, and before I get to some of that, I am curious. So how many of you are running at least one database in the cloud right now? Okay, all right. So there is a section where I'll talk about some things in Azure that even if you don't have the budget for a tool, um, there are some things you can do natively that cost not very much at all that will give us some of what the other tools do. Um, and I forgot to say, but any questions, comments, whatever, feel free to raise your hand. It's, it's not a huge group. Um, you can even shout at me. I prefer if you don't throw anything, but if you do, make sure it's soft and, and not sharp. And how, so I'm guessing because we're at SQL Day, there's a fair amount of SQL Server folks here. How many of you are also managing Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, something like that? Okay. All right, so there's a few slides in here. The last time I gave this, it was a developer conference with a data track. So there are a few slides in here that mention some tools that either I've used or my friends that spend a lot of time in that world said, hey, these are good tools. Um, so feel free to comment there uh, because I, I always want to make that, you know, everything I'm putting up here, I always want to be better than, than the last time. So if you feel like there's something you can add there, we can chat. All right, so for SQL Server, what, what I'll say is these are the three uh, arguably most common that I've seen. These are not in any ranking order. There are other ones. Um, but when I go to a customer, because I've been in consulting more or less for, for about eight years, when I go to a customer, this is most of what I've seen. Um, so if you remember Century One, uh, SolarWinds purchased them. That's now SolarWinds SQL Sentry, unless they've changed the name again recently. Um, that was excellent. And actually, the last, um, the last kind of full-time um, database management job that I had, this is what we used. Now, I will say um, that since SolarWinds purchased them, it, was, it became harder and harder for us to get support and things like that. So I still see this tool a lot. I still think it's pretty good. Um, I'm not sure the acquisition has been kind, but um, that's just something to know. So you'll have people say like, oh, don't buy this. It's terrible, you know, because they don't like SolarWinds or they don't like, or they had a friend that worked for Century One and, and they don't like what happened. Tool is still decent, um, but there can be some challenges around it for sure. Redgate. So SQL Monitor, um, I would say I used to use it years ago and it was quite good. Their attention then largely turned to their CI CD tools, which are very good, and SQL Compare and all that. And SQL Monitor was still a part of the product offering, but probably not getting um, the attention it had. That has changed. So 
um, if you're like me and you used to use it or used to know about it, and you're like, gee, what happened to that? I didn't see it very much, but I'm starting to see it more now. That, that's why. They're putting more money into it. Um, I have a couple of customers using it now. Pretty solid, and it's kind of a natural fit if you use any of their other tools. And Idera makes a tool as well. Um, this one, it's funny. There are some customers... And I think that's the reason part of these vendors grow the product offerings the way that they do. If you get one tool from that vendor, they will then buy everything else. Um, so I'll, I would say two of these three kind of fit that mold. SolarWinds, I, I don't see a lot of their complementary tools when I see a place running uh, Sentry for these other two. Um, I, I do see where they, they basically have everything that they make plus this. Four... Postgres. I would say the one that's most popular with my customers that are running it, my friends that spend all their time in, in this world, Datadog seems to be popular because it can monitor so many things. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you still have to purchase the Postgres integration to get it to work. Do you know? Because, Dan, you guys are running it. Got it. Well, I was told this was the case in February, um, so it could have changed. Yeah. Okay. SolarWinds also makes a tool here, too. Um, it is very different, like SQL Sentry, Sentry 1, whatever you want to call it, was historically a SQL Server tool, still is. But SolarWinds does make other monitoring tools as well. Um, theirs can offer you a look at MySQL. And there's a tool called uh, App Optics APM that I put on here because um, I have a friend that runs a very large Postgres estate, and that's what they use. To be honest, I have never seen it anywhere else, but they are so large that I felt like I should share that here because if it was a good choice for them, it might be a good choice for you as well. We'll briefly go through these because I think I only saw a hand or two, but Oracle, surprise, SolarWinds show, shows up again. They're a big company, lots and lots of products. You're going to see them on on this list a lot. Um, if you're sitting here and wondering, well, okay, I don't have any of these. We do have budget for it. I'd like to buy one that maybe fits Oracle Postgres, some of that. Um, DB Watch covers multiple ones, and I have a few Oracle DBA friends of mine that recommended that as well. So if you're not baselining, and if you don't have one of these tools, um, where should we go from here? So one of the questions I get at this point usually is somebody will say, okay, we don't have any of these tools because we don't have a data team or we have a couple of DBAs, but they're, they're rolled up under operations or, or systems or something like that. But we do have tools for those teams and they have database stuff. And so that's where this slide comes from. So PRTG is a pretty common monitoring alerting tool that you'll see that kind of talks to just about it, everything. Um, any decent sized shop where we had like an externally uh, facing website or something like that, you generally found this somewhere. So I get asked, well, okay, we don't have any of these database specific tools. Can we get away with these? So, and I, I break this up because in my mind, PRTG and New Relic are similar, but not quite the same. So PRTG for me is, is very much just kind of an alerting. It'll tell you when something's down. It'll tell you there are certain thresholds that the database stuff is pretty light. There are certain things you can set where it say, well, it's not down, but it's slow. Um, but you don't really get, there's no deep dive. So you can know that it's slow, but if you're like, well, is it a, you know, is it a resource issue? Is it a code issue? Something like that. It gives you none of that information. So for DBAs, we're, we're going to want more than that, or we're going to want to supplement the fact that this says it's slower down with something that we've built. Um, so I don't recommend that for database stuff, though, yes, it does hook into everything I just talked about. New Relic, kind of similar. It does go deeper into that stuff. So I have had arguments with um, lead operations people and things like that. And they're like, well, we don't need a database tool for this at all because New Relic does that. And New Relic will show you, it will take a swing at showing you what it thinks the database is doing. The problem is when it does that, 
for me, it feels very much like a tool written by somebody that has not managed a lot of databases before, because it does not give us the kind of information that I think we would want. Um, so if you're sitting there saying, well, we have these, can we use them? You can, but I would supplement them either with one of the tools we just talked about, or maybe some things you can write on your own, which we'll talk about across the next few slides. Uh, any questions or comments about that? Okay. All right, so point number one here. How many of you have heard of Glenberry's diagnostic queries? I know you two have. <laughs> Excellent, okay. For those that haven't, these are awesome. Um, so I, I do not recall his website right now on Twitter. He's Glenn Allen Barry. Um, I've got links to all this stuff on, on my resources slide at, at the end. So if you've never heard of Glenn, when I got involved in the SQL community, um, other than just reading blogs, it was probably 10 years ago. He was then, and I would argue is still kind of the hardware guy. There are many of them. But he, he loves the stuff. He builds gaming computers as a hobby, so it's not just server hardware. Um, he writes queries, and he releases them every month. And I don't recall, you, you may know how long they go back, but I mean, I was using these 10 years ago, and I feel like they go back farther. And yeah, and he keeps up with every change and every CU just about and all of that. So these queries give you outside of a tool and even including all those tools we just talked about, probably the deepest insights into what your SQL Server databases and servers are actually doing. Another thing he's just started doing, so these, this download is basically a, a bunch of SQL. One thing he started doing a few months ago is also publishing an Azure Data Studio notebook that contains all of these as well. So I'll stop there and ask how many of you are using Azure Data Studio? Okay, so we'll step away from the main topic of this talk, and I'll get on my soapbox here for about half a minute. ADS, is it's not a replacement for Management Studio. It's not intended that way, but there are some things for a DBA that it does that I think are very, very helpful. So if you have maybe overnight teams, offshore teams, something like that, and you have run books for things, and I hope that you do, this talk is not about that, but if you have run books for maintenance, incident response, things like that, it is, notebooks are the absolute best way to do those because we can put them in source, it will persist any of the results. So long gone are the days where I'm asking somebody to do something overnight, and I have to send them like a Word document or a link to a SharePoint site and say, okay, when you run it, take a screenshot of what happens, put that in the document, send it back to me, upload it, whatever. Notebooks is a one-stop shop for all of that. So if you've not had a look at those, please do. Um, you know, it, I get asked a lot if, because uh, I used to give a talk just on Azure Data Studio, because I am kind of a fan of it, in case you can't tell. Um, and a lot of people is like, well, is it going away? Is it intended to, you know, is Management Studio gone and Azure Data Studio is the new thing? No, I think we're going to have both of them for a very long time. But in my mind, day to day, I would, I would be using both because I think both are cool. So Glenn puts all of these into a notebook as well. So if you're wondering like, well, okay, I've heard of ADS. Yeah, Matt says it's cool. Maybe I should have a look. This can be a, gr a great way to kind of check both of these things out. So. If you're sitting there and you have no budget for a tool or anything like that, and you really want to do a deep dive into all this sort of performance information, Glenn's, you can use his as, as a way to get started and write all kinds of your own stuff. Obviously, just credit that you used his help. Um, there are resources. So the SQL Server Tiger team, to be honest, I don't know if it still exists under that name, but the GitHub repo is still being updated. The organization is a bit questionable, <clears throat> but there are tons of good resources in there for checking best practices. There's a lot of always on AG stuff. There's some like VM performance metric stuff. And like I said, the, just kind of browse the repo. It is not really broken down into organized things. It's, it's a lot of what I think the teams internally used. So it's a mishmash of T-SQL, 
Azure Data Studio Notebooks, uh, there may be some other programming languages in there, probably some PowerShell too. Um, but it, it, it's not great if you're having an incident right then and you're looking for like a targeted fix. The Tiger Team repo is not where you want to go. But if you're sitting there thinking, all right, well, I need to build some, I need to build some of this monitoring myself, um, go in there and check out what they have. You're going to learn a lot. Um, but like I said, it's not, you're not going in there to fix a specific thing. Uh, how many of you have heard of Brenozar? Of course, yes. So um, he has the SP Blitz stuff. There's SP Blitz cache. There's there's a whole list of things. Those can be very helpful, particularly if you're sitting there and you you have been promoted or elevated to a DBA role unexpectedly, like the DBA left, and they're like, you write reports or you do this or you do that. You're the DBA now too. And you're like, where do I start? You know, this like Glenn stuff sounds cool, but you don't you don't want to sort through all that code. Um, Brent's can be a great way to get started, especially if it's a server that you're not familiar with at all. Those, it's a set of tools that he and other folks that used to work for him wrote, and I believe still at least lightly maintain, but it will tell you what's going on with your server. And, uh, uh, and it also offers some, some help. Some of it redirects to Microsoft and other educational links. Some of it does redirect to blog posts. On, on his site, so it does kind of feed that a bit. Uh, but those can be a great jumping off point if, if, if you've inherited a bunch of servers or inherited that new job role and, and you really don't know where to turn. As far as concepts, Kevin's video here at the bottom, so Kevin is one of the people that founded Pass, um, which unfortunately no longer exists, but Kevin's been doing SQL Server stuff a very long time. He did a video when he worked for Century One that I do link to that's probably the best presentation I've seen on how you should approach monitoring and baselining your servers from kind of a conceptual standpoint. So if you're sitting there thinking like, well, okay, I don't even know where to start. Like, do I care about resource usage? Do I care about query speed? What do I need to look at? Um, he, he does a good job of kind of setting up what you should be looking at and why for different types of environments and things like that. So if you're saying, well, this is a good idea, I'm excited to go get started, but I don't really know how to approach it for what I'm trying to do, check his video out, it's around an hour, well worth the time. Any other resources you think should be on there that aren't? Well, that's good, it means I did a good job, hopefully. Okay, so just talked about a lot of ways, a lot of things that can help you get started, but there are still some people who like pain. And they're like, I want to start from scratch. No, I know I can't buy anything because I don't have budget for it. I know you just talked about these helpful tips and I've got a bunch more that come after it. But what if I just want to write my own stuff? Like I don't want anybody's help. Don't be that person. But if you are, there's a couple things up here that I can tell you. So I took on kind of an operational, like on-call DBA role, boy, probably about 15 years ago now, uh, where we were supporting a system that had to run all the time, every day, every hour. I didn't know a lot about what I was doing then, and we had no budget. So we had budget for Enterprise Edition SQL Server and always on AGs everywhere, but I was told that we had no budget for anything else, so no tools. I didn't know about the stuff that I just talked about. So what you can do, you can go into Perfmon. So how many of you look at Perfmon every once in a while? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Not a common tool for like, hey, I'm going to go check out how things are going. How many of you is that part of your toolkit when there's an incident going on, server slow, something like that? Spin up Perfmon to look at some stuff that way. Okay. So it's good for something like that. Um, but if you don't have a monitoring tool and you're wondering oftentimes physically or even for a VM at like the OS level, what's going on here, uh, Perfmon can be a good way to check that out. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, David Klee's got a really good blog on it that's linked on, on my slides as kind of a, if you've never been in here before, what should I do thing. Um, 
but yeah, it's I wouldn't rely on it for common monitoring because it's a mess and the interface hasn't changed in I don't know how long. Um, how many of you query the DMVs within SQL Server to know what's going on? Cool. Okay. For those of you that don't or may not know what that means, um, that is basically, it is SQL Server keeping track of its, its impression of everything that's going on everywhere. So it will do some things about storage performance. You know, there's some things around file stats. There's a lot of things around, okay, when this transaction was committed, here's what was going on around it. You can go really, really deep on this stuff. Um, the problem is there's no good starting point. So I link to an article later that actually Microsoft put together that's pretty good, that's pretty much like, you don't know what a DMV is, how do you know what to look at? And it kind of walks you through, like they're kind of top 10 and, and what to look at, what to kind of filter out, and all those sorts of things. If you're not doing any of that, you can start the way that I did. And I wrote my own reports that sent me email, started out once an hour, that was basically how long, because our system was almost entirely stored procs. There wasn't really a lot of inline SQL in our code. And so I had stored procs everywhere. So I started writing my own stuff to say, okay, um, it would email me like top 10 by total execution time, uh, top 10 percentage, the top 10 largest percentage changed. So if something was, let's say, 50% slower than it had been the previous day, hour, whatever, it would bounce to the top of that list. Um, Query Store does a lot of that now, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But at bare minimum, that is, for me, I think, a decent baseline of how things are going. Like I said, 15 years ago, that was what I did because I didn't know about any of this. So at least start there, but we have so many other tools and stuff that we can uh, use. So I would prefer for you to start there maybe, but not stop there. Okay, any thoughts, comments, questions about that before we go into the next part? Okay. That's true, yeah. Is that, is that still supported? Because, okay. Because I know management data warehouse, I'm, I'm trying to recall when it came to the product, but it's been in there a while. I couldn't remember if it was still, but yeah, excellent point. Okay, so how do we know what isn't fine? How do we know when things have gone wrong? So how many of you, when there's an issue, generally the first you're hearing about it is you get a ticket, a Slack message, Teams message, something like that. Well, let me, all right, so let me ask this another way. When you hear of a problem, how are you generally finding out? And you can just shout stuff. Okay, so monitoring tool says, hey, this thing is slow, this thing is down. Well, okay, that's cool. Anything else? Right, right. And are those... <laughs> So I know, I know the answer for you, but I saw a, a few other heads nod. Um, when users complain, and I hope this isn't the case, are they reaching you directly? Or is it filtered through like customer support or something like that? What was that? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about, so. I would always want to see some processes established around that. I know when you're a consultant and you're kind of like their performance person, that may just come to you like that. Um, so we'll put that to the side for a bit. But if you're on an internal team, I, for our good, I would hope this is coming to us via tickets. Um, I've worked in an environment where we didn't really have support tickets. We had yell at Matt on the chat app. Um, which is not good for our mental health for sure, but also not great to get the problems fixed because you have no sense. It might be four people yelling at me about the same thing. So if you're in that where it's kind of wild, there's, there's no structure. Somebody just hits you up, team slack, walks down the hallway and says, oh, it's down, ah, it's slow. Um, try to bring some structure to that somehow, like 
even in SharePoint, you could do something with lists that would kind of approximate a ticket. So you've got a history, you're forcing somebody to write down their impression of what happened. You kind of have a way to track that. That always helped me. Um, so definitely try to try to use that if you're not using anything right now. So going back to how we receive reports like this, how many? So when you're getting them from a user, how many of you are receiving reports from somebody else technical? Whether it, whether it's another DBA, systems admin, app dev. Okay, so you can have the same problem when you're receiving that info from somebody technical versus when you're not. And it's that the database typically is the foundation of every app, right? So we have to store the data, serve it up to them. So the problem is when the app experiences an issue, then whose fault is it? It at least starts that way because everybody's like, well, my app is slow. What's the thing that's the foundational piece? It's the database. So I'm going to go talk to that team because obviously they've done something wrong. And even very smart technical people will think the same thing. So when, when we get a ticket, an email, a Slack message, whatever, one of the things that sounds counterintuitive to say it, but one of the things we should do is take a step back and look at these last two points. So we, and, and I used to be bad about this, sometimes still am, we get so excited, nervous, motivated, whatever, to fix a problem that we don't step back to see if the problem's actually ours or not. So there's an example of this um, client I had a couple years back. We were, they were receiving, and this was an application that unfortunately, if, if there were errors downstream, the application showed them to the user. Don't get me started on that, but it did. So we know that practice is poor. But on the flip side, when a user would call in, they generally had a very descriptive error message because we weren't masking those at, at all. Uh, so users start a call in, and they were getting timeouts. So it was a variety of messages. They weren't always from SQL. But it was generally the .NET code saying, I went to talk to the database, and it didn't talk back, or it took too long. So naturally, that sounds like a database problem, right? And my team approached it like that. Said, okay, we've got something going on. But we looked at our tools. Everything was fine. Well, it led to a fairly loud phone call because I said, well, listen, all our tools are fine. Let me go talk to, to the app devs. They've got their own set of monitoring. Um, let's see what's going on with them. Well, they, same issue. All their stuff was fine. Resource usage, good. Uh, speed seemed to be okay but we were still getting these errors, even though everything said everything was, was fine. So we got into a bit of a fight over what the issue was. What none of us did was take a step back and think about what had changed. So I don't have a bullet point on this slide, but when you get a ticket in, number one, go, if you have monitoring stuff, go and look and make sure that things are good. So if things are bad, you're gonna wanna jump on that right then. But if things look good, you know you've received a problem that may or may not be yours, it may or may not be something you can fix, take a step back and think about what changed. Did we release a new version of something? Did we buy new hardware? Did we change a configuration, change a trace flag, something like that? What the issue was is that we had migrated part of one application. All the web stuff went to the cloud. And all the database stuff stayed on prem. It was only supposed to be for a day or two. But, and we had tested this, and our, our express route between ground and cloud was fine, so users wouldn't notice. But what we were not monitoring for, because we trusted our provider to do it, is if performance degraded in the express route. So the database timeouts we were getting, was they were not a, it was not a database issue at all. The app level thought it was because it couldn't get to our stuff because there's this very long pipe between us and them. Had any of us taken a step back, like, you know, we should have trusted ourselves. Okay, our stuff's good. Our stuff's good. What's between them? And we didn't look at that. So we did adjust that. Obviously, we started to monitor for that. Um, 
So that's another kind of takeaway here. If it's not a database issue and you're really and you're struggling to pinpoint it, think about and, and this is obviously goes outside of like a DBA or data person team. Um, think about things you should be monitoring that maybe you aren't right now. There are probably gaps in that. Um, we had an experience group, and that was one thing. We monitored everything internally and everything cloud and not the thing that linked those. So think about it when it comes in. You know, don't, don't do what I did and, and get the, you know, basically send the whole team into action fixing a problem that wasn't ours. We wasted time when actually this was a relatively simple fix. Call the express route place and say, hey, this is really slow. Um, but we took a couple hours. So yeah, do not recommend. Um, anybody have any similar stories like that where it looked like a database issue, the error message is said it was, but it actually was not? Okay. All right. So how do we proof this? So we talked about how we take problems in. We talked about a wrong way to try to solve them. But generally, what this is going to end up being is not something that's that obvious. There's going to be a lot of components to whatever the issue is because, you know, we do deal with hard downtime sometimes. But a lot of times, this is more just, hey, this is slow. Hey, this used to be fast last week, and now it's, you know, it's not as fast as it was, or it used to take a one second, now it takes 10. So from the database perspective, how do we prove what's going on so we can work to put a fix in? Because a lot of time, again, we have to prove what the issue is because we're unlikely to be the team fixing it. There are things we can do with indexes and stuff like that that we don't need anybody else for. But if it's a code change, most places I've worked, you couldn't just send a DBA into the source code and make the change. It had to go through some sort of a process or you worked with that dev team or something like that. Um, if you work at a place where, you, where they're telling you just to go in and change live code, that makes me very nervous. <laughs> Please don't. Um, try to establish some sort of process around that because I, I have had roles like that. And the problem is no matter how good you think you are and how smart you think you and your team are, you will make a mistake at some point and you will make it against a live system, which is not a nice feeling at all. So how do we prove this stuff? Number one, monitoring tools. So whatever tool you have, um, a thing I've done in the past, and you have to be careful about this. And there's kind of, there's not one right answer for every situation. But I try to give at least the more advanced technical users, whether they're sysadmins, devs, whatever, um, at least some sort of read-only access to the monitoring tool that I have. Now, as a word of warning, you are likely to get some questions that, that I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this, uh, that, that maybe aren't the best questions. Because you're going to have somebody go and look at something, they're going to think they see a problem, and they don't. So. As you open up access to the tool for people to go look at it, understand you're going to field some questions where you're going to have some moments where you need to educate people, probably about how SQL Server does certain things, because they don't know. And they're going to think they see a problem. They're going to come to your team when that problem does not actually exist. But this can be a very good way also for developers to understand the impact of what they do, too. Um, you know, I can think of a scenario where once we started to open up access to the tool, you know, they, the way their database code was written was essentially DBAs were not involved in any sort of performance analysis at all until the code was live. Um, that has since changed. But we had no insight into what the developers were doing until it showed up on our production environment because they tested everything locally with containers and small data sets. We didn't see it until it went live. And we had a perpetual problem every time we had had a new version of something come out. The DBAs had a very bad day the next day because we were sorting out all the problems that they had. Um, so opening up access to this tool, actually, not that they, it's not like they were trying to release poor code, but they just were not good T-SQL devs, basically. 
Um, and we, you know, we didn't have, have the process in place for them to come talk to us, which we then fixed. But when they could actually see the impact of that and understood what we were dealing with and understood the stress they were putting the servers under when mistakes like that were made, they actually worked a lot harder to avoid those and worked a lot harder to include us because they realized what a problem they were causing for me and my team. So definitely recommend that if you've got a tool. Um, if you don't, so DMV queries, querying for weight stats, which we'll talk about here in a second, those can be very handy. The problem is you have to, for all this kind of stuff where you're showing like the deeply technical bits of SQL to try to explain why performance suffered or why this issue that happened happened, you kind of have to put a bit of a narrative around it. So I would, I would caution you from just sending like a query that joins a bunch of DMVs across something to say, well, this query ran and it caused all these weights. And that in the wrong hands is probably going to end up with the wrong fix because somebody's going to see it and be like, oh, well, I just do this. Like I can think of a place I worked where the lead application dev kind of fancied himself a DBA but had never worked in that role. And there, there was a day they had released a hotfix for something. It caused a particular type of very odd weight that you don't see a lot. He Googled the weight. The first hit he found was bad advice, basically said to throw on an unsupported trace flag and restart the server. So he did. So all of a sudden, my team, uh, all our monitoring tools went dark because our entire environment bounced because he was allowed to do that. That stopped after that day. Um, don't let your app devs restart your servers. But um, so he did that. And I very nicely went on Slack and said, what are you doing? Um, why did you restart all, all of our servers? He's like, oh, well, I, I fixed the problem we were having. He didn't. What he did is take information that he wasn't understanding because he had access to it and then responded in a way that he shouldn't have. So don't let your app devs uh, have system admin access on your servers if you can help it. But it, it's, it, it, it kind of gets back to this issue that I'm talking about is when you're, if you're writing kind of like a post incident report or something like that, and you're showing all these weights and all this other stuff, put some language around it to help management and the other technical folks understand what happened. Don't just kind of give them that information. Like make sure you've got language around explaining what happened and make sure you've got a targeted fix uh, because left to their own devices, they may do the wrong thing. So that seems like a decent segue into talking about weight stats. So how many of you know what weight stats are? Okay. Uh, so for those that don't, basically what it is, is when you go, and there's a variety of ways to do that. We'll, we'll talk about one here in a second. Um, when you go in and look at processes as, as the SQL box is running them, SQL will tell you what it's waiting on. And that's just a normal thing. Like I have gone places where there was not a DBA in sight, and they think weights are bad. Weights are normal. Some weights are bad. Uh, but it's basically saying, hey, you've asked me what's going on here. Well, I'm working on this, and I'm waiting on this thing to happen so I can go on to this next step. The problem is there's a ton of bad advice online, like my app dev friend ran into, on what to do around certain weights. If somebody, they may experience a weight, and the way they fixed it worked for them for some reason, but isn't a universal fix, isn't a supported fix, Something like that. So that link there, Paul Randall, who worked for Microsoft for years, who was consulting for years, and now I think is kind of semi-retired, but still blogs and stuff. His site at uh, sqlskills.com is the best library for weight stats information anywhere. Um, if you want to better understand weight stats, read all that stuff. If you want to better understand how to analyze what's in the DMVs to not only understand what the weights are, but kind of put together the scenario of what happened so you can work on a fix. Tons and tons and tons of good stuff there. But again, don't, don't, give, don't put that information into the wrong hands without us having some sort of control. 
Um, so speaking of wait stats and speaking of trying to figure out what's going on in our server and trying to prove to people, hey, here's the problem and here's how I think we should fix it. How many of you, uh, how many of you have heard of SP who is active? Yes, okay. If you have not, just go download it. I think the current downloads are at whoisactive.com. Um, it's community supported. I don't think it's had an update recently, but basically what it is, so that every server I've managed for years and years and years, this was on every box. So I could just go in there and run it. Whenever we had an outage, an incident, a report of anything strange, in my mind, this is absolutely the fastest way to find out. You just go in, run it, and there's a tons of switches. You can get a lot of verbose information, but I just go in and run it, and it, it shows you, here's everything that's running, here's what it's waiting on, here's a, here's a bunch of information around it, and a lot of times, it's the quickest way to go find that fix, because it gives you, even if you have a tool, you know, you don't have to click through a few screens, you just run it and know. So, um, I saw there were a few hands that didn't go up, so I will kind of briefly walk through what it looks like. Um, this was from a live client, so if it looks like there's been data that scrubbed, it's because there was. Um, so what we've got, so this is just kind of an out-of-the-box run. And so what it does here, it tells you database name. If your app devs are nice to you and manage to label the application, it will tell you what the calling app is. Um, it will do a start time of session, and it will also say the time that it ran and all those sorts of things. But the more interesting stuff starts to come here. So in a lot of high concurrency environments, you're going to have deadlocks and blocks and that sort of thing. And I get asked a lot, well, what is the quickest way to figure out what's going on? A couple of the monitoring tools, um, SQL Sentry being one of them, will show you kind of this blocking chain. And it's, it, it's a decent interface that says, well, this is blocked by that, it's blocked by that, and your root problem is here. Even when I've had those tools, I always run this first because blocking session ID over here on, on the left, that you can trace that back yourself. And in my mind, at least, I can do that that way faster than any tool can. Now, if you do have the tool, the graphical nature of it can be useful if you're trying to explain it to somebody who's not a tech person. Well, this operation was blocked by this, was blocked by that, so the fix is to make this one go faster or whatever. Really, really big help here. Um, we also have, so for the operations that have it, you'll get a percentage complete for like backups, things like that. We also get the number of reads and writes that that session has done. And we get the session ID. We also get the query text where it's able to pull that out. So that can be very, very useful. And I can think in particular of one place that I worked where we had a lot of problems with this. There, um, the dev's understanding of locking and blocking was not very mature, fair to say. And so we had a lot of problems with this when, when a new version would land, roughly about once a month. This saved me so many times because I could go in and say, okay, session five, or not five, but session 100 was blocked by 105, was blocked by 110. 110 was running this code here, and I could go into their Slack channel, go into the ticket, whatever, and say, okay, the culprit is this, the code is this, where did it come from? Because I didn't have insight into their source code. I, I couldn't go search that stuff. We made so many fixes so much faster just from that there. I mean, it, it, it saved us money many, many, many times. Um, we also have weights here. So that can help, particularly if you have some devs that are a little more advanced on, on the database side of things. You can tell them, okay, this session, this bit of code, and the weight type is this, and what that means. So don't just tell them that, because they may go and kind of affect the wrong fix. But you can say, what that means is, I went on Paul's site, and I read what that means, and it means you should do this, or it means that this is happening you know, under the covers. Um, SP who's active is pretty much the greatest thing ever. So if you're not using it, please, please do. It has saved me many, many times. Any thoughts about that? Okay, 
All right, so how else to prove this? So right now we've talked about some stuff. We've talked about a lot of things you can do in every version of SQL, um, it, whether you're still supporting 2000, 2005, all the way to 2022. Um, but there are some more modern tools that actually can be very helpful. The interface around them is much better, and we don't have to pay a lot for them. Sometimes nothing at all. So how many of you are using Query Store? Okay, so I'm curious, for those that aren't, which is fine, uh, what is the reasoning? Man, okay. So I'll tell you what I've heard, not to put words in anybody's mouth, but when I've asked this in the past, it, there's, there's an impression out there that Query Store is a performance drag, particularly on a system that, you know, speed is... All, speed is everything you need. It's like, I cannot afford that performance drag. Arguably, when Query Store was released, there was a little bit of one, but for most systems, you couldn't notice it. They've done a lot of work to improve that. And you can tell that because in SQL Server 2022, and every database you make in Azure SQL anything, Query Store is on by default now. So maybe there were people internally that's like, okay, it is a little bit of a performance drag. We don't want to turn that on automatically for everybody because we respect that there's some people, it's like they, that 1% or whatever, they just can't afford it. Now it's on everywhere. So I kind of feel like that's the signal to the rest of us that you should be using it everywhere. Um, because all the tools we've talked about, some of those cost a substantial amount of money. Query store is free. You're paying for it anyway. Uh, so if you're not using it, I would definitely recommend a second look at it because Microsoft is now using it everywhere. And I feel like that means we should too. So um, I know we had a few hands up when we talked about what, uh, who had stuff in Azure. And unfortunately, basically because Microsoft, is, you know, Azure is their cloud, SQL Server is their product. This part is very Azure specific because there's stuff you can do in Azure that the other clouds just haven't done yet because they're not Microsoft's. Um, so if that's, if that's not for you, sorry about the next couple minutes here. Okay, query store. You'll notice I put that on this slide again because it's so important. You should use it. You should use it everywhere. On-prem, cloud, all that stuff. If you, so how many of you have heard of either query performance insights or SQL insights in Azure? Okay, cool. All right, so. For me, I'm a little bit curious as to why both these products exist. Because if you go and look them up and you go and kick the tires on them, they do a lot of the same things. I think it is, it, one or both of these strikes me as Microsoft's attempt not to undercut the monitoring tools because they partner with them on a lot of stuff, but to give us some things out of the box that all the stuff I just talked about, if you're running in Azure, you don't need any of what I just said. You can just spin this up. It's free, or um, you have to provision a log analytics workspace. Those aren't too expensive, so it's, it's free-ish. Um, both of these are still in preview, as last I checked. And I, I would assume they will both continue to exist, but to me, they, they walk a lot of the same ground. Um, a couple things to note. So SQL Insight works across Azure SQL whatever, including Manage Instance. Query Performance Insights, as best as I can tell, is Azure SQL Database, but not Manage Instance. Um, what's interesting, pardon me here. Oh, there we go, screen froze. Query Performance Insights mandates that query store is on for it to work. So a lot of that internal data that it's gathering, it wants to use query store to do that anyway. And then what these do is try to put a nice face on all that. You, you'll get some graphs. You'll get a lot of what query store gives you. You know, these, this part of the workload slowing down, this part's running fine. Um, you may even get some suggested fixes. So if these sound interesting to you, if you've got some stuff out in Azure, um, and you're like, well, we don't have money for a tool. All that stuff you talked about earlier that I can do myself, I don't want to do that. But this sounds cool. Uh, there was a data exposed uh, several months ago now where an, an, an 
internal Microsoft resource, basically walk through these, how to set them up, what they can do for you, all that. So if that sounds like something you might want to see, check that video out. It's like 10 minutes long, and then you can see if maybe this helps. All right, so we've talked a lot about problems. We've talked a lot about how we get them, how we figure out what's wrong, how we prove that to people that aren't us. But I do kind of want to bring us back to some things about process here. And I've kind of alluded to these, but I, I, I like to pull it aside in, in this slide. So when an incident comes in and we get to the point where it, it needs to be fixed, how do we do that? Number one, state the problem. That sounds silly, but I've been on a lot of these incident calls over the years. And the call, the meeting, whatever it is, works so much better when somebody's like, okay, we have identified thing X happens and we are investigating it. Or better yet, we've identified that this happens. We know that thing Y caused it and we're going to fix thing Y. But somebody stating the problem during the call always makes the rest of the meeting go better and it makes the fix go faster. Once you've stated what's going on, the next thing you should do is identify all the teams that have to help. Like I said, a lot of orgs, the database, it's always on us. It always rolls downhill to us. Don't be afraid to speak up for yourself, for your team, and say, okay, yes, we understand that maybe there's a database issue, but we can't fix the code. So we need app dev, we need sysops, we need whatever. Whatever information you need to find that fix, don't be afraid to state that. There's a lot asked of our teams, and it's not always entirely fair. Where a process exists, follow it. Don't, if, if an app dev says, well, it's easier if you just go in and change the code and prod, we don't want to go through, a, you know, we don't want to push another version or whatever. Say no. They're going to think you're being a pain. But I have been a part of a lot of these where it's like, all right, yeah, I know it is faster if I go do it. I go and do it. But there's something we didn't think about because we didn't test it. It's just an idea that we turned into action. I have caused more problems than I have fixed by skipping processes. So please don't. Last but not least, I said we would kind of wrap up with this. So we've spent 57 minutes, give or take, talking about servers and stuff like that. These jobs can be hard. You know, we, we're asked to work long hours. We're asked to work weird hours. As I mentioned, there's a lot of pressure on us. That can be a great feeling when things are good can be a very bad feeling when things are bad. So this sounds silly to say, but make sure you kind of know where you're at too. Um, you know, I, I can think of weeks where I was woken up several times overnight, but that feeling of fixing a problem, particularly when a system's down, particularly when you didn't cause it, but you fixed it, that's an awesome feeling. You get that rush, you feel like a rock star, but are you actually feeling good? When I left that role, and I left because the hours got so bad, I started to realize how bad physically, mentally I felt. But you're in that constant rush of problem fix, problem fix. You're not taking a look at, at how you really feel and whether you're actually performing at your best. You know, there is that rush, and that, that feels good in the moment, but are you actually making all the right decisions leading up to that? Probably not, because you're exhausted. So baseline, you know, every morning, wake up, be like, all right, how do I feel today? Feel free to make a chart of it. I know a lot of folks that do this. I do too. Um, it doesn't have to be formal. You can just, every morning, when you sit down, have a sip of drink, just, how do I feel? I feel good. I feel bad. Happy, sad, whatever. Journal it. Write it down. I use this app. So this app, it's a bunch of emojis. Basically, how do I feel? Did I eat? Did I exercise, drink water, all that stuff? Um, and click that session. So that session's where I learned about this app. There's other kind of helpful tips there as well. And don't forget, there's only one of you. There's only one of us. So there is no failover. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. You follow process where it is. You bring in partners where you need it. These hours can get very, very long. Consultants can help. I don't just say that because I it. M1, I say that because they helped me. Um, speak up for yourself and the team, like I said. And even though the superhero complex feels good, it's not. 
So make sure the knowledge you have goes everywhere else. It's part of the reason that I do this. And last but not least, we're all going to be fine. There's a lot of ways for us to get help here. Slack, Discord, SQL help hashtag is the greatest thing. There's a lot of smart people that monitor that and answer questions easy and hard. If you liked the talk, you may like my books. My wife gets a kick out of this slide, so there you go. These are all the links that I talked about earlier. Please make sure to visit your sponsors and all that. Here are all the different ways to find me. Feel free to reach out, feedback, good or bad. I don't want to keep you from lunch, so that is all I have. Thank you so much.